You guys can't see this, but I have a cat who's trying to encroach on the camera. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, welcome to our Women Leaders event hosted by APABA DC, which is the Asian Pacific American Bar Association of the Greater Washington DC area. APABA DC is the oldest Asian American Bar Association in the DC region. For the past four decades, APABA DC strived to meet all three central pillars of our mission to serve as a voice for the APA legal community in DC, to elevate and promote the advancement of our members, and to facilitate opportunities to give back and collaborate with other community organizations. I am Samantha Guo, co-chair of the Women's Forum. Our Women Leader Series aims to conduct candid conversations with women leaders within and outside of the legal profession focus on how we as a profession can do more to elevate each other and to better promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. Along with my co-chair, Angeline Chen, the Women's Forum is thrilled to bring you tonight's event, focusing on the importance of the Asian American Pacific Islander vote with a fireside chat with Cam Ashling a longtime democratic activist and advocate for the AAPI community. Angeline Chen, my co-chair for APABA DC's Women's Forum, will be moderating tonight's conversation. For years, Angie has served as a voice for DEI efforts and the AAPI community, and was instrumental in putting together tonight's event. We strongly believe that the only way to bring about change is to raise our voices and be heard, especially for AAPI women. In this challenging and divisive times, political engagement and voter turnout of the AAPI community is critical. We therefore are very pleased to bring you this relevant and topical conversation. We encourage everyone to submit questions via the chat box throughout the program. Now, without further ado, I'll pass the virtual mic and stage over to Angie Chen. Thanks so much, Sam, and welcome everybody, and especially a special warm welcome um, to our featured speaker tonight, Cam. Um, listen, folks, the presidential election and multiple electoral lawsuits and debates of 2020, along with the Georgia January 2021 runoffs, have made clear the importance of how voters shape and influence our government and lives on the local national level. 
During the historical events of the past year, the Asian American Pacific Islander community's voice likewise made strides as an instrumental segment in key elections across the nation. Um, As my co-chair Sam has pointed out, Cam has been instrumental here. She's an absolute force of nature in the AAPI community in Georgia and nationwide. She's a small business owner, a financial planning professional, a mother, and a well-recognized AAPI community leader. She's a longtime Democratic activist who serves as a campaign manager for representative-elect Marvin Lim's campaign, who will be the first Filipino representative of Georgia, a member of the Georgia American, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders for Biden-Harris Leadership Council, and the AAPI constituency director for Senator John Ossoff. Her work of engaging AAPI voters in Georgia played a key role in securing the senator seat for Senator Ossoff in the 2021 United States Senate election. I will note here that APAPA DC is a nonpartisan organization. We do not support or endorse any specific candidates or parties. However, as Sam rightfully noted, AAPI political engagement and voter turnout are nonpartisan issues of keen interest to our community. And that should be for obvious reasons. So given the past year hearing from Cam, promises to be insightful, informative, and most importantly, fun. Um, And so Cam, welcome. We're thrilled to have you join us tonight. Um, You have a very unusual background uh, in terms of your life. And I thought we would start a little bit about um, asking you to tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are, um, your childhood growing up, and what shaped you early on in your life. Um, I think, you know, being a... uh political refugee when I was young definitely impacted how I started in my life. Um, you know, I came to the U.S. Uh, when I was um, eight years old after having spent um, a year in uh, refugee camps um, from the refugee camp in Thailand and the refugee camp in the Philippines. Um, so when I got to the United States, um, I was very shy. I was very behind in my education. I had an interrupted education. I did not finish like the first grade when I was in Vietnam. So when I came to the US and I was put into the third grade, I realized like I didn't have a command of my multiplication tables. <laughs> you know, I had no math teaching. Um, I had to learn uh, like my ABCs. And then, um, you know, I would even have to even kind of sing the song in my head to kind of get an idea of where all the letters were at. Um, it didn't come naturally to me because I had an interrupted education. And then of course, coming over, uh, I was very shy, you know? Um, I remember once my, my teacher had found like a Huey, Dewey and Louie eraser. If you guys remember DuckTales, like, I don't know if you do, but if you do, you remember DuckTales, uh, those cartoon characters. And she asked the class, like, whose eraser is this? And it was mine and I wanted, but I was too shy <laughs> to be like, it's mine. You know, like everybody would look at me if I raised my hand, right? So I just stayed quiet. I just like, you know, I didn't claim my eraser. So, so that was me when I first came to the United States. Um, An incredible story. Um, and then let's let's take a look at a slight montage of kind of where where you are now um, on this incredible journey from those beginnings, um, where not only are you a strong and clear and fierce voice in the political landscape, um, speaking on behalf of the AAPI community, but you also run a business. Um, you have many many things, just as you take care of the AAPI community and Asian Americans across the nation. You're also taking care of an entire, I don't yeah. even know what to call it, an entire group of various <laughs> animals and critters and kids. So tell us a little bit about some of the experiences that we see reflected here. I think it must be my childhood or my psyche wanting to go back to where I came from. And you know, when I was in Vietnam, my parents um, had animals running all over the place and we were down the south 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 like the zero mile of vietnam um and i was born in a hut so you know i guess i'm recreating some of that for my kid and for myself so i have goats and i have um um, royal palm turkeys i somehow foster some 
peacocks, but now I foster fail and now they're with me. <laughs> <laughs> I get my friends like, uh, she said she couldn't, she had these pair of peacocks and they, um, they keep, they have kids, but then she couldn't get them to hatch out and raise them. Like, all right, just give me some eggs. I'll do it. I know how to do it. So I incubated these peacocks and I've been incubating animals and critter to have this, um, like an urban city farm, like I'm a hobby urban city farmer in the middle of Buckhead, Atlanta. And if you know Atlanta, you know Buckhead is kind of like the, you know, the fancy ritzy side. Um, but that's what make our, our house like a tourist attraction. And we have lots of kids and families come by and they um, feed the goats from the fence and um, enjoy the, the madness like I do. Well, and in addition to being a mom to, to your wonderful, bright and bubbly son um, and all the small and large critters around you as well, um, you're also a professional financial planner. Um, and so tell us a little bit about running a small business and some of the challenges there in terms of building that hey, up. Dan. Hey, Samantha, how are you? I'm great. Uh, how are you? Hey, Sam. My life is probably much better. There we go. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Um, you know, being a business owner during COVID has been hard for everybody. Um, and, you know, because I actually run multiple businesses, I, I do financial planning and I also um, run a, a short term hospitality business. So um, the hospitality business, of course, got like crushed, but we survived through it. Um, and, you know, traveling is coming back. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm with all the small business owners um, that has kind of suffered through, you know, having to deal with like a loss of uh, customers, you know, especially restaurant owners, I think have had it really bad. Um, even the nail salons. But I understand law is a little bit easier because you guys um, can do a lot of work, um, you know, online and digitally. Right. And how did so as if you didn't have enough on your plate, somewhere along the line, something drew you to becoming more politically active and engaged. And was there a trigger point that sort of drew you to that? Was there an opportunity? Did someone reach their hand out and ask you, or how did that come about? I think I gradually grew into it, you know, because I used to be on the nonprofit side of the world. I, I came in when I was like, um, 24, 25 years old, and I was on the board of OCA Georgia, uh, formerly the Organization of Chinese American, um, the, uh, the Georgia chapter. And I, I spent like years on that board trying to advocate for, for different issues. Um, and then, and, you know, I just started to realize like, what do we need? We had a, so many groups. We had uh, so many Asian American groups, but what, what's missing? And if we keep, you know, telling people inside our nonprofit to go vote, go vote, but then they're like, well, go vote for who? Well, we can't say because we're a nonprofit, right? Um, so that was an issue. And then I found out that if you really want Asian Americans to vote, you got to give them somebody to vote for. And what do Asian Americans want? They want people to look like us to run and they can vote for. You know, so then we're like, well, so then we need Asian American candidates, you know, and, and, and how, how do we get Asian American candidates? Um, and, you know, this is where having a, a political action committee comes in because we can then recruit Asian American candidates to run and then also provide support because it's hard to get Asian Americans to run for office. You know, it is really a, a labor of love. And then there's so much scrutiny to be an elected uh, official. Um, you lose some, some sense of privacy, of course. Uh, I've recruited many people who said they didn't want to run because one, it didn't pay very much. And then, <laughs> and it was very time consuming. And then they would have like all these, um, uh, you know, critiques the disclosures and yeah and you'll be like under the microscope and everything you do and say will be even more scrutinized than it is so you know just finding the pieces of what we need in our community i think has led me to um fill in the gap and then 
I'm kind of like, I tell people I'm a lazy leader. Like if I can find somebody else to do it and do a good job, I'm happy not to do it. And I'm happy to push and help somebody else do it, right? <laughs> well, if you listen to the business schools, they'll tell you that that's leading by example through delegation. Okay, yes. I'm, I'm just like, that's just how I do it. <laughs> if I can do it that way, I do it that way. So, so I've been trying to get um, really awesome people to run for office. And then that motivates Asian Americans to run. Like, for instance, you know, Marvin Lim, um, he, uh, he was a, uh, you know, a, an immigrant uh, from, you know, he, ro- he rose from like public assistance to like go into Emory and then to Yale Law. And then he's in civil rights work. And now he's like, a, you know, first Filipino um, state uh, representative. And in Georgia, I don't know if you guys know, but everything is like the first, you know? <laughs> The last couple of election cycle that we've been doing, you know, it was like the first Filipino American, the first uh, Asian American commissioner of Gwinnett County. You know, the uh, like Sam Park was the first um, openly gay Korean American, and then Bing Wing was like the first Vietnamese elected um, for a state representative, and then we had like Dr. Michelle Oh, like the first senator for Georgia. So um, I say. Part of what motivates me is being able to make that history happen for our community. And I think that's important um, when I try to um, motivate people, you know, to go out and vote, get your friends, your family. This is for Asian American history. It's not just for somebody else, you know. So that's been part of um, uh, the strategy of uh, motivating our young people or our older Asian Americans who, who who lack, um, you know, the ability to ever vote for somebody with like a name they are very familiar with, you know, like one of their own, it gives them pride and hope. Well, it's amazing, right? Because the fundamental fact is, is that someone could just take one small section of all, all of your life. And this obviously doesn't represent the entirety of what fills your life, but so much of this already would basically crowd out what other people would say is time that have to set aside to kind of pursue helping the larger community in that fashion. And so that's absolutely remarkable. I do wanna pull a little bit on this to to show folks some facts about the AAPI vote. Um, And these these are interesting statistics and facts that were pulled from a number of polls that were done. One of them was done by APIA vote which is a 501c3 organization, which actually tracks, um, and in particular in 2020, uh, they tracked sort of the, the, the AAPI electorate tendencies um, about what was going on as we were going into the 2020 presidential cycle. Um, they did this poll, they polled about 1600 registered Asian American Pacific Islander voters uh, over a two and a half month time frame, roughly ending in the September 2020 um, time frame right before the November election. And I thought this was a rather interesting jumping point to kind of then start talking about what you were doing on the ground, in particular going into the presidential cycle and then afterwards into the January runoffs. Um, the Asian Americans are actually the fastest growing ethnic uh, racial group in the United States right now. And one can say that considering that we represent roughly 5% of the entirety of the United States population, um, it's easier to grow faster if you're small, but nonetheless, the statistics are there in that more and more AAPI community members are becoming aware and conscious of the fact that they do need to engage, that they do need to vote. And this is universal across the nation in terms of getting the vote out, period. But in particular for our particular community, um, it is starting to essentially show numbers where perhaps the community is becoming more aware and more alive on that front. Um, the immigrant voters in our community are roughly as many Asian Americans as Latinx. Uh, there's more than 30 countries. We are probably uh, you know, the first to be able to lay claim of the vast and broad diversity, even amongst our community alone. Um, the language uh, diversity, the ethnicity diversity, the origin diversity, um, and the fact that nearly three quarters of the adult Asian American Pacific Islander population right now was born in another country Um, and how that plays out in terms of what speaks to the issues that they deem most important. Uh, Roughly 70% of AAPI voters astoundingly in 2016 said that they were not contacted. There's a typo there, there's a missing not. Um, They were not contacted by either political party in 2016. 
And even in 2020, with everything that was going on, nearly 50% still said that they were not contacted by other party. Um, for you, and this I attribute a lot of this uh, with respect to Georgia, 6.6% of the first time voters in Georgia were AAPI, even though the AAPI population in your state is 2.5% of the registered voters. Um, so you can sort of see, and especially what happened with respect to the January runoffs, I'm gonna stop sharing this now, um, the impact that the grassroots outreach um, of the sort that you led, frankly, and you were very visible in that front is absolutely incredible. And so I kind of want to go back into history and sort of ask you, why, why do you think political parties and candidates overlook the AAPI vote? Because one, you know, we're a small group of the voting bloc, okay? Don't mind my chicken. And, uh, <laughs> and we're difficult to deal with, okay? Because of the, the multiple languages, the multiple group and ethnicity. Um, so it can look very challenging um, for a traditional campaign to say, how do we engage that community? There's a lot going on. Um, so how do they get kind of like a, a return on, on their investment in that community? What we've proven in this campaign is if you hire Asian American leaders, community activists, you will know and you will get the tools you need to market and speak and mobilize that community effectively. So the last two presidential cycles, um, 2016 and 2020, I mean, I, I don't know that it's all that arguable that they were unlike any other in, in history, right? It, there was the flip of the House, uh, the US House in 2018, states that were traditionally blood red uh, turned solid blue in 2019, like Virginia. Um, and then of course, Georgia, uh, the historical events in Georgia, both in 2020 and 2021, for the AAPI vote, and this is a little bit of what you were just sharing, was there anything different about this particular past election cycle, aside from the intense focus on alleged, you know, alleged election fraud, the voter suppression and the challenges caused by the pandemic? Was there anything different you felt with respect to the AAPI community, something that invigorated them a little bit more or caused them to be a little more attentive or easier to reach? Yeah, well, the racism, <laughs> definitely. You know, for, even with, without COVID, uh, you know, without the voter suppression, we still had so much racism that um, racism was a big issue in the community for 2020 and 2021. And I think another big contributing factor um, is kind of like for Georgia, the maturity of our organizing power. It, you know, we were, we were getting more um, precise, we were more, getting more experience, you know, from like 20, um, you know, 18 to 2020 to 2021, like there was a lot of growth. Personally, I felt I was growing a lot. Every cycle I was doing, I was learning something different. You know, before, uh, back in 2017, when I started the Georgia Advancing Progress Pact, just for, you know, state and local election, um, all we did was collecting money, we, we wrote checks, right? And then later on, we're like, well, why don't we um, print something? So we, <laughs> we went and made a flyer. And I was like, oh, look at that, we made a flyer. This was so great. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> And, and so we started like having a printer relationship with somebody and I found people who could like design our flyer and we printed it with mail. And then I was like, well, that was pretty, pretty good. Um, and then like the next round, uh, I would like do emergency canvassing in 20, um, 2018 for Stacey Abram back then. And I didn't know how to do it, right? I, the only reason why we even, uh, started saying we can do it is because like 23 days before the election <laughs> yeah some money rained on us you know from out of state and and then i was like okay i guess we're gonna have to do something now <laughs> and i had no experience with the the vote builder system so i had to learn very quickly and then like pop up a canvassing team you know 
in in like less than 10 days to go and canvas and knock on like 10,000 doors. Um, but we took that experience from that from that cycle and then we kicked it up another notch, you know, and now we're producing more signs. Like I found people to do different things. Like during the 20, um, during the runoff, did you see our yellow Asian American boat signs? Was yes. That, the greatest? that was the greatest, you know, thanks to um, um, me finding Jessica. <laughs> And it, and it used to be where I was trying to like design stuff because I designed Marvin Lim's yard sign, um, but it would take me forever to do. And then we were writing postcards and it was taking me a long time to organize who was gonna write what and what and what. So, um, and then of course, you know, we had to do all these postcards in language because I, I, like, I cut these lists where if you were 40 years old or older, I gave you the, um, uh, the English language postcard, you know, and I, I signed it to the Chinese group or I signed it to the Vietnamese group, I signed it to the Filipino group, I signed it to, you know, the, the Urdu uh, writers. Um, and then if you were younger, I sent you in English. <laughs> that's, a, um, that's incredible. That's incredible. I mean, you know, so in the, in the neighborhoods where where I've been privileged enough to live, you know, there's very little canvassing. Um, people stay to themselves, particularly if you're either in the urban areas or the rural areas. Um, sometimes folks aren't necessarily that friendly, or it's 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 hard to overcome the shyness of going up to a stranger's door and knocking. How did the pandemic impact your canvassing efforts and these sort of grassroots oh, efforts? That was horrible. <laughs> Like we were trying very hard not to canvas, to be respectful of the situation and not to further or endanger our, our canvassers, you know, but at the end, um, because it gotten so close in 2020, I said to Marvin, Marvin, we have to run like emergency canvassing. You know, I'm like, order the face shield. I order face shields. Um, and we had to be so precise because we couldn't canvas everybody. It had to be like, I need an overlap of District 7 and overlap of 99. I need you to like, you know, hit these very specific doors. Um, yeah, so we couldn't just have a mass effort, you know, and, and it was really hard to breathe under the shoe and the mask. <laughs> and if you're walking a lot, you're like huffing and puffing, right? So it, it dampened, it did dampen our canvassing game, but we, we ended up kind of like taking the face shoe off and just going with the mask and then knock and then stand back, you know, from the door. Um, and we then, and then when we ran AAPI canvassing um, during the runoff, uh, I knew that there was going to be a lot of activity in Metro Atlanta, right? So I took my canvassing team. I'm like, we need to get out of Metro Atlanta. We need to go where like nobody wants to go, but there are some Asians. Let's go down to like, um, you know, an area outside of Augusta. Um, there were like some Asians there. So we went there. It was, you know, one canvasser reported like a Confederate flag, but nobody chased us off with guns. And, but we were, I was mindful to tell everybody, be aware of where you are and just exercise like good safety measures. Um, you know, because there are also people there that are blaming us for the death of half a million Americans, right? Um, yeah, and then of course our expense for canvassing is very high because you're asking people uh, and, and usually they're like our younger college um, students and such to go canvass. I have to now pay them COVID rates. <laughs> Well, we used to pay him $15 an hour, you have to pay him $20 an hour. <laughs> so, um, so that was expensive, but um, it, it had to be done because uh, sometimes, you know, people are not good at asking for help, but if you're at their door and you're asking them, you know, can, can I help you check on your status? Do you know where you're going? Um, you know, they're like, okay, oh, I just moved here and I don't know that, da, 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 da. and then you really do help people. And it's, it's all these little helps and every vote counts that, that accumulated to, for us in Georgia, less than 12,000 votes that flipped the state. How would, 
what was the general receptivity? So for, for some of these families, some of these voters, this may have been the first time we mentioned the stats before that, you know, even in 2020, in September of 2020, 50% of the AAPI community surveyed said they, they hadn't been contacted by either political party. What was the general receptivity? I, 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 that's, uh, whatever that is, or anywhere else, it was not true in Georgia. <laughs> Well, probably because, well, this, remember, this was in earlier 2020. So this yeah, is, you know, yeah. and, and so afterwards, and certainly going into the January 2021 runoffs, um, what was the general receptivity of folks when, when they opened the door and they saw one of your canvassers standing outside the door? Right. They're surprised. And then, you know, younger people, they're like excited, you know? Older people were surprised, younger people were excited. And then I would like give them all these paraphernalia I had because I had my giant truck and I was driving around like a gift shop. <laughs> Look at some maps, a sign, here's some buttons, you know, go tell your friends, help us do something. <laughs> Did you get a sense of, in terms of, well, obviously the results speak for themselves, but um, of, the, of the folks that you basically canvassed and actually reached out to and made contact with, do you have a sense of how many of them actually went and followed through or did you have to do follow up like making sure that they had transportation, for instance, to to wherever their voting uh, place might have been? Um, some people who were on our radar, we had to really hold their hand to get them through. Right. Because I remember having to go. I came as a lady. She's like, I'm not going to go vote. I have my absentee ballot, but I've got no stamps and I'm not going to go to the post office. And so I go and I go find stamps and I deliver stamps. I mean, you know, you know, every vote matters to us and we'll take the time to do it. Um, we, we've had um, like even uh, Latinx uh, ladies who were too scared to go vote by themselves and we had to give them escort. You know, because, uh, yeah, because some people are scared and they're being told, that, oh, if you go vote, they're gonna arrest you or something, even if you're perfectly fine because now there's police at you know the poll sites. Well that's and that actually raises an interesting question. I mean did you did you have actually experience or did you see or did you hear reports of any sort of voter intimidation particularly geared towards the AAPI community? I um I don't know if there was like a coordinated effort to scare off the Asian. I don't think that was happening but there are you know uh, occasional incidents um, where people are like, okay, you know, you're voting at the wrong place, go, go home, you know, or like if you sneeze, people look at you and like, you know, yeah, <laughs> away from that person, um, and you, and, you, and you're feeling unwelcome. Um, we had, so you know, during 2021 for the runoff, I was trying to get our younger voters to get excited about voting. And we had um, bubble tea at the polls, you know? And I'm like, this is great. This is a great idea. You know, it was kind of like souls to the poll, but it was bubble tea at the polls, like Asian style, it's a bunch of young people. <laughs> and we were gonna make voting cool again, right? <laughs> and, um, and after that, and then after doing a, a food at the poll event too, um, because I, I knew um, another great activist who did that in Arizona, um, the Secretary of State came out saying, uh, there are to be no food or drinks, you know, whatever, yeah, uh, at the poll. So where we traditionally were able to do poll warming, you know, especially in Georgia, when there's a long line, it goes for hours, like people and kids, you know, they need like a small drink or they need a snack to keep them going. They're just standing there. But the Secretary of State wanted to squish that. And that was, um, I thought, a uh, shady move, you know. Was that challenged? Um, or was well, it just too late? It was one of those things we where- We did it anyway. And I'm like, you want to arrest us, we'll go to court about it. I mean- <laughs> Over a bubble tea. <laughs> Over bubble tea, whatever, yes. I'm like, you know, what is this? Um, and of course, when we do that, we do, you know, nonpartisan, we follow the rules. It's just straight, no condition, um, just making it fun for people to uh, engage in their civic um, right. So yeah. let's let's talk a little bit. Um, you just mentioned about the fact that you know a lot of this is just the fundamental principle of people voting. 
right? It's a privilege in this country. Um, it's a way to basically make sure that your voice is heard and have a say in yourself, regardless of what party, what candidate you're basically supporting. Um, what I found interesting in the AAPI, the APIA vote uh, survey was they actually did a breakdown uh, amongst the different ethnicities that they surveyed. And they had not all 30, but they had a significant chunk of the larger segments. Um, and although they found commonalities of the different types of issues that the AAPI community really sort of gravitated towards, healthcare, uh, social justice issues, economics, um, what was very interesting was that for the most part, the AAPI community in the aggregate tends to lean democratic and towards more progressive issues, um, with the one exception being on the economic issues where they tend to lean a little bit more towards conservative or Republican value, traditionally Republican values. One really odd sort of um, data point, and I think you know where I'm going with this, one, one odd data point that came out of the survey was that there was one demographic that actually leaned very strongly Republican, and that was the Vietnamese segment. And I'm wondering if you have, I'm wondering if you have some thoughts on to why, why that might have been. I mean, it's, it's a hard yeah. question. It may not be a fair question, but no, what, no. what are your thoughts on that? It's a great question, you know, because uh, it also um, causes me a lot of uh, anxiety. You know, our, our Vietnamese community there's like a generational gap is how I, I would explain it in our in our um, community. And a lot of time our older generation um, Vietnamese American care more about what's going on um, in Vietnam. Okay, because most people don't know, but right now there's a giant um, national issue going on in Vietnam where China is trying to take Vietnamese land, uh, bully the Vietnamese and um, uh, cause all this uh, animosity that the Vietnamese people in Vietnam hate the Chinese. So if um, the president were to be very anti-Chinese, they're very happy about that. And they will go to war, you know, for that, for that person as they would go to war to defend the country that is their homeland. Um, so a lot of that is, uh, is that piece of it. And then you gotta remember like the majority of Vietnamese Americans, they're also Catholics, right? So we have, because I think it's also a, like a low voter information uh, group that they have a few issues they care about and they don't care about other issues, right? Um, some people are, uh, they're just gonna be pro-life because of their religion. And if the Republicans are pro-life, the heck with the other, you know, political party. Um, and they will not care if you know leaders in that party are um, uh, racist or whatever else. It just doesn't matter, right? You know, I think it's an amazing uh, microcosm in terms of how complicated these issues can be, and essentially what motivates any particular voter. But particularly for member of the AAPI community, um, I do think the generational issue becomes a real challenge. And the language and cultural issues become real challenges too, but. Um, yeah. It is true. It's funny. They say politics is local, right? And yet the, the, tr the transference of what's happening perhaps in the home country um, or the ethnicity that you, that you relate to most closely um, and the impacts and how that gets interpreted, um, especially if someone isn't coming and basically giving a counterpoint to, to whatever that worldview may be. Yeah, but this is also true, I think, for the South Asian community, too, uh, with what's going on in India. And then, um, you know, even the Chinese community. So, you know, we are Asian American, but because so much of our community were foreign born, that aspect of what's happening um, in the motherland drives um, political uh, opinion and actions here. You know, we don't have that with like young Asian Americans. They're just like, we're Americans. We care about stuff that's happening here. And that's a great pivot point, sort of the, the next area that I wanted to just sort of chat with you a little bit about. And that's that's the representation in government, um, not just elected officials, but also appointed officials. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure uh, many folks in the audience uh, may or may not be aware, but certainly um, after the AAPI uh, uh, electorate basically showed up um, for the current administration, um, there was a lot of dismay. I have a cat basically trying to encroach now on my part. Um, 
there was a lot of dismay over the lack of actual Asian American appointments in the presidential cabinet. Um, and so there were certainly appointments made like Catherine Tai, who is now our new USTR. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is there isn't anybody at the cabinet level, which is the highest level of federal representation. And so I, I wonder, of course, we have uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, um, which is an amazing, you know, an amazing first. Um, and there is there is the truth that this administration has arguably the most, it's not even arguable, um, the most diverse uh, cabinet in history. But but what are your thoughts about the significance of the decision recently taken by Maisie, um, the senators from Illinois and uh, Tammy Duckworth and Maisie Hironi about threatening really to withhold their votes on certain nominees until the administration made a little bit more commitment towards reaching out to the Asian American Pacific Islander community, which they did. Um, there was the announcement just, I believe, yesterday or this morning about uh, appointment of an AAPI liaison. Um, but what do you think about that decision where the where the two senators essentially said, you know, we're, we're maybe going to slow down your appointment of nominees, which is yeah, for their party. Not. This is what political power is about, you know, uh, if you're not going to share and um, and and give us um, space in a, such an important administration. Um, we can protest and kind of go on strike. And what's amazing about that too is that it was two AAPI women senators um, that basically did this to make sure that in fact our voice was heard. So that leads to my next question, which is um, a little bit asked and answered, but, but the importance of AAPI representation amongst our candidates. So we had Andrew Yang, uh, who was a presidential candidate. Presidential candidate. Um, there are but a lot of inroads. Help. That's right. And a lot of a lot of inroads being made, certainly on the state level um, as well in state legislatures. Um, but but what are some of the what are some of your thoughts about getting more? You talked a little bit about 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 it in the beginning, but but what does it take to basically get more AAPIs getting into the the political cycle and putting themselves up for for vote for election? Yeah. I, I know a little bit about the inside of some of these appointment issues. And one of them is that there are a bunch of Asian American groups. What we need to do when we submit a list is we need to submit one list, not three lists and everybody's confused. Like I think we all got to band together and support the few people we fully back and, and push with that. You know, otherwise I think the administration gets too confused about, well, who's that group, what's this list, and how do I make people happy if they're not on the same page? So we probably need to short, sort that out um, between ourselves, and then we can have you know, one united front, and that will help. That's a, that's a great point. I mean, it's, it's you know, sort of this, this, uh, this huge disappointment in that this is the first time since 2000 that there isn't actually an Asian American in the presidential cab cabinet. Yeah, I can't, I can't believe it. I, I was shocked. I was like, really? <laughs> um, but first, I was not even thinking very much about it. I was like, well, isn't the, the VP API? So was he counting the VP as API? So he didn't have to find another API person in the cabinet? Was, that, was he thinking that? I, yeah. Unknown, unknown. Yeah. But I yeah. thought it was... Uh, I thought it was an amazing uh, a fact that, you know, I mean, there, there actually has been, and even in the last administration, Elaine Chow was, was the Secretary of Transportation. So, um, you know, the, the, the key thing is, is again, you know, if, if the two senators hadn't spoken up, uh, then there probably wouldn't even be a little bit of movement or at least recognition, um, a conciliatory gesture with respect to having that representation there. Um, I'm keeping an eye on time. Um, let's just switch a little bit about maintaining, uh, switching over to maintaining momentum. Um, for our listeners in particular, uh, what are your thoughts about what we can do to help ensure that the AAPI voice continues to be heard? That this isn't, you know, sort of a flash in the pan and then we're sort of disintegrate into our little pockets and our little communities or sub-communities. I hope that everybody on this call, uh, no matter how busy you are or, you know, where you work, really consider running for something. Okay. Because if we don't have high quality candidates, 
um, it's going to be very hard to engage the community. I found this out with the Korean American community in my um, in my state, which are not really like one party or another party, right? They're really more like who is running and what party. That's like a second bit to it. So if we had um, so so for my personal strategy down here, I always got to have an Asian, uh, a Korean American running as a like for my side of, of who I want to uh, go for to make sure that the Korean American community goes and vote. So if everybody would just consider, you know, I don't care if it's like a school board or like a, you know, city council, even start small, we really or go big, run for Senator, run for, you know, state rep, run for governor. Um, you know, Andrew Yang, I think, you know, made that clear. We just can't be like, oh, do I deserve to run? Am I good enough? You know, that's our Asian, uh, negative self-talk but look yeah, I, it's... I, yeah and and i say uh equality is when we have mediocre asians running <laughs> <laughs> that'll be our slogan um well and it's amazing too a lot of these grassroots and you had mentioned earlier on about um having money coming in from out of state and that's you know it 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 can't be denied that the political system that we have for better or for worse runs a lot on money and donations um, and it's really hard because in order to get someone to part or to donate, you know, part with their money and donate um, to your particular campaign, you have to be known to those people. They have to feel some sort of, uh, you know, affiliation with you or some sort of affinity with with what you stand for, or what your principles or what you look like. Um, what are your thoughts with respect to um, sort of the use of social media or, or, you know, the Internet and email, the virtual world, particularly even before the pandemic? Um, the ability to utilize that as a means of essentially funding the campaign. And, and does that have any sort of contradictions with respect to being a local candidate, um, but nonetheless needing the money to pay for stickers, to pay for signs, to pay for canvassers? I mean, what, what are your I'm thoughts on all, that? I'm all for it. You know, it's, it's everything matters. Social media matters. Um, you know, getting donation from out of state matters because if someone is in a state that's always red or always blue, they're not going to feel like they're able to make a change, but they can just port, you know, some of that contribution to somewhere that they can make a huge difference. Yeah. So um, like even in our, our small Marvin Lim campaign, we had out of state donors and national groups, um, you know, LGBT groups uh, from out of state supporting the campaign. And I use tons of, um, I guess I'm more into Facebook than I am some other social media groups. Uh, so I can like feel like I have some control of it. <laughs> yeah, but we use a lot of uh, the social media tools to organize, um, especially if you want to reach younger voters now. Now we have to be on TikTok and make silly TikTok videos, right? If we want to be relevant to them or else they will start making you know, TikTok videos that uh, may or may not have the message we're trying to convey. So. Your goats could start making TikTok uh, videos. You could probably set up your own channel and get a lot of draws that yeah. way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we, we printed a goat vote um, yard sign. You know, instead of go vote is goat vote. And then it's my Huey goat with like sunglasses <laughs> on and a cape in pink. You know, um, and then making politics how you want it to look like. Like we changed the way campaign signs look like. We changed the messaging. We um, we flew a ton of flag. We were like a hundred and ten percent. We rallied on the street. We we did everything, and we were not afraid. Even though looking back, we're like, well, that was kind of dangerous, right? <laughs> Oh, well, all, all I know is that you had some awesome dance moves when you were standing on the side with your sign at one of the rallies that you had. And then yeah. your flag waving skills are, are yeah, un we, unparalleled. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, we harness that. I, so the way you do is you get a wave in a certain way that doesn't get tangled. So you got to have some rhythm. But there's uh, an art form to it. There's an art form to it. But Asian people are like resourceful, fast learning, and, you know, we can make it our own and create the movement that we want to see. And, and that um, helps 
to bring others into the movement. It can't just be a few of us. It's got to be all of us. And we got to have like, well, I tell people we might be just a few people, but we make it look like we're like hundreds. <laughs> Use a lot of mirrors. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so one of the things too is that, you know, the energy that was pouring into the presidential election and the Georgia runoffs was was just un, un, unparalleled, unequaled. Um, but equally important is the quiet spaces in between, right? So, so of late, there have been a number of states that have passed voter rights legislation. Um, some might call them voter suppression uh, legislation, right? Depending on how you, uh, depending on what perspective you have. Um, what what thoughts do you have about basically keeping energy up so that people outside of an actual election cycle, essentially realize what is happening with respect to the legislative activity going on in their state and what can they do to essentially make sure that their voice is heard, that they, if they're against you know, such legislation or for such legislation, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts about how they basically keep track and get engaged? Yeah, um, so sign up with your local uh, like advocacy group that kind of monitor bills and, um, and you know, for, for us, it's the Asian American Advancing Justice Georgia. Like they do a good job of monitoring the bills. Uh, you can be on emails list of like your um, your representative, and they should give you kind of like a summary of what's going on. But for things that you don't support, we will go and go to the Capitol and protest about it and have signs. We will call our legislators and pressure them to vote no. Um, you just got to make a big stink about it, you know, because. Uh, if you don't, then they think nobody cares. But if there are hundreds of people calling their phone number, tell them to vote no for something, they're like, oh, maybe that's a bad idea because if I do that, I might lose my job the next round. Um, and, and don't be scared to uh, call it like it is. You know, if, if there are bills out there that make it harder for people to vote absentee, and you know that the Asian American community likes to vote absentee, that's not good. We need to speak out against that. You know, if the time is now. The time is now when these laws the are basically now. passed. Yes. And then, you know, we, we have, uh, like in Georgia, we have Fair Fight, and they'll, um, they'll legally challenge it, challenge it, just like in the same way that we challenge other bills that we thought were unconstitutional or discriminatory um, and challenge it that way. But I, I feel like the momentum is so strong and if we keep driving and, and, and getting more people activated, no amount of voter suppression is gonna stop our, our community from voting. Because if we know what, it, what they're gonna do, we can work ahead of that and try to educate our people um, so that they, um, they know what's going on and th they make it to the polls and then their votes get counted. It's so important. I just, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, and I, I want to close on a, a somewhat somber note. So the past week and a half have been incredibly jarring um, for the AAPI community and particularly women. And I know you have been um, absolutely beyond how remarkable you normally are to begin with. Um, I know that you met with the family members of some of the murder victims uh, down in Atlanta, Georgia. And I just, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, for, for all of us who've struggled with the impact of the knowledge of, you know, sort of where this fits in this, this long, long history of um, pain and challenge and struggle, uh, sometimes not even necessarily even recognize, right? Because we tend to sweep it under the rug or we swallow it. Um, what are your thoughts on, on how the AAPI community and in particular AAPI women can strengthen our sense of unity um, despite differences of opinion, even politically or otherwise, um, so that we actually can raise our voices collectively against social injustice. I mean, what are your thoughts on sort of to the extent that you've been able to distill the last week or so of, of just absolute pain and horror? We, we need more Asian American women to speak up, to tell their story, um, and to have the attention, you know, too many of us are uh, not willing to talk about, you know, when my grandmother, uh, you know, was married to a black man, they were like, you know, beat up and they were spat on and whatever. Like we need these stories. 
and that's got to come out. Um, and women, we we need to host more women-led events. And then if there are rallies, if there are speaking engagement, uh, people need to center Asian women more. You know, I had to do this in, in some of our rally where, um, you know, I had to change the, the MCs and I had to like reconfigure the whole thing the night before because I was like, what? <laughs> no, you need Asian, and one, I need Asian Americans on this stage. Two, I ideally want local Asian American and three, Asian American women, right? And, you know, and everybody else that don't fall in, in those lists um, can be a supporter to help the cause, but I need Asian women leading. Um, so we need to do things like that, like have these uh, hard conversation where we see that the room is not set right, right? And, and we, we need to speak, speak up. And we need to speak up, right. So when there's a space, Asian American women need to speak up, speak out, be loud and proud. Well, you have been throughout your entire life um, the way you live it, the way you reach out, the way you support the community, a shining example of exactly that. Um, and for that, Cam, we can't possibly thank you enough, but I really wanna say that we are so happy to have you come and share your time with us tonight um, with the audience. And thank you for all that you've done and will continue to do, um, not just in Georgia, but frankly, across the nation uh, with respect to that voice for the AAPI community and particularly for AAPI women. Um, we're, uh, we're going to thank everyone for joining us. We are right at the bottom of the hour. Um, I have a couple quick housekeeping notes to share with you. Um, we hope that you'll join APABA DC for future programming. In particular, we encourage you to join us for some upcoming events uh, focused on what the District of Columbia state and federal governments can do, especially to combat AAPI hate, um, which is obviously a topic that is hitting every single one of us in, in many different ways. Um, next Tuesday, March 30th, we'll speak with renowned former civil rights division leader and civil rights lawyer, Roy Austin, and former U.S. attorneys for D.C. and Maryland, Jesse Liu and Rob Herr. Um, then on April 7th, we'll be speaking with D.C. and New Jersey Attorneys General Carl Racine and Gerber Grewal. They'll also chat about criminal justice reform. And then we'll follow this on April 12th with a conversation with Congressman, uh, Congressman Andy Kim from New Jersey, who will follow up on these themes of AAPI political power that we discussed today. Um, in addition to talking about how we address AAPI hate. You can find out about all of these events and more as well as RSVP to any or all of them. We'd love to see you again uh, by joining us as a member. So you get weekly newsletters and other perks or by just visiting our website, which is www.apaba-dc.org, apaba-dc.org and visit the events page. We thank you all. And Cam, thank you again so much for joining us. It was a privilege to spend time with you tonight. Um, and I hope everyone has a great night. Thank you, everybody. It's such an honor.